Hello, we're here today to talk about all the desktop repurposing options available in the market. This is a project we've done in the past, and this is just an opportunity to update you on the results and the latest vendors. So uh, I'm Matt Evans. I work for VMware. I'm one of our EUC SEs. Um, this work is kind of a side project. This isn't something that, that we've been asked to do. It's just something that we're sort of interested in doing. Alongside me is Darren. I'll pass over to him. Thanks, Matt. I'm Darren Hirons, Manager of Solutions Engineering for UK and Ireland uh, for the Digital Workspace. Judy? Thanks very much, Matt and Darren. I'm Jonathan Jassy. Um, I'm also a solution engineer working with in working in the EUCBU, and uh, I'm delighted to have been invited into this project. Uh, so looking forward to talk about it. Yeah, it's good to have an extra pair of hands this time around. So first off, we'll kick off with the agenda and we'll take you through the results. So as mentioned, this is the desktop repurposing project. Hopefully you've seen some of the previous ones. In terms of a quick overview um, of the project itself, this is something we've been doing now for four years. And this will be the fourth year of, of running through the tests and reporting back. This year, as mentioned, we've got uh, JD to help us. So it's nice to have that extra pair of hands. In terms of the sort of things we do is we look at the process of converting an existing you know, desktop, albeit a laptop in our case, into kind of like a thin client. So this is from vendors like iGel and um, Tenzig and uh, Unicon. We'll, we'll go through that in a sec. And we look at how long it takes to convert, how easy it is to convert. And once the device is converted, what is the performance like? And this time around, we'll also look at the management software, which is something we haven't really done in the past. The results, we just take them and share them. That's through blog posts, that's through LinkedIn, that's through vMugs and just trying to share the results with the community so people can see what sort of options there are out in the marketplace. In terms of the devices, in the past, we've had to sort of grab any hardware we can. This time, we all use the exact same device. So this is kind of real apples for apples and a good fair comparison. And we all use the Dell Latitude uh, 7410. Still pretty high performance, but sometimes it's quite hard to get older hardware to see how that performs. In terms of the actual vendors, um, if you've seen this in the past, this will be very familiar to you. However, this time around, we do have a new vendor, which is ZTIM. So we'll also be looking at that. The, the vendors here are a mixture of uh, Windows conversion, Linux, and also Chrome, obviously from Google. Um, we, we did contact all the vendors, much as we have done on the previous three cases. Uh, a few of them we heard back from, but it didn't really work out in terms of the testing. Um, and a couple we didn't really hear back from. So this time around, we're gonna be focusing on six of these vendors. As we always do, we just do it in alphabetical order. So there's no specific reason we do them in the order that we do. It's just purely gonna be alphabetical. So we'll be starting with Tenzig. In terms of the horizon testing, we all connected to the same pool of desktops. This is a cloud hosted uh, VMware horizon environment. We use the BLAST protocol. We looked at things like um, high-end graphics, so GPU, uh, multimedia performance, uh, flash performance, or, or YouTube performance, should I say. And, and one thing to know is when we look at the Blast performance, we don't make any uh, out-of-the-box changes. So the configuration of Blast is all out of the box. We don't make any um, tweaks on the client side. We don't make any changes to try and improve performance. We're just using those, those out-of-the-box settings. And it's also worth noting that because it's cloud hosted, there's a bit of latency, which is good because that kind of shows the performance and, and how Horizon and, and Blast, more importantly, would cope under those conditions. So as I mentioned, we're going to look at the vendors in alphabetical order. So first off, we'll kick off with Darren to cover Tenzig. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, I te tested out Tenzig. You'll notice on the slides that the 2021 column from last year was empty. That was because we actually didn't test Tenzig last year. I think they were between releases at the time. But we did test it this year. The latest version is 16.4.30. And the hardware requirements haven't changed much since we tested this two years ago. Um, the imaging time was really fast. I mean, I, I, I re-imaged the disk uh, in under a minute. It was 43 seconds. And the boot time was, was pretty rapid as well. That was a minute. So imaging and boot time, really easy. You can boot from the USB. And you can actually run the OS from the USB. But what it does is it, it dumps uh, an icon onto the desktop, which allows you to image the hard drive. 
So literally in under two minutes, I would say you can boot from US boot to USB and you can have the hard drive imaged. So it's really fast. In terms of browsers, there's Chrome on there, there's Firefox on there. There's a fairly up-to-date version of the Horizon client on there, which is 2111. There may well be a newer version, you know, at time of recording, but the one we tested had 2111 on it. Protocols that are supported are Blast, PC over IP and RDP. Obviously, as Matt just said, we only tested Blast. And from a power draw uh, point of view, I, uh, I recorded that the average power draw when the device was idle was 17 and a half watts. And when we ran Workspace One and Horizon concurrently, that went up to 26 watts. The management tool that we that I tested as well is the Tenzig Manager. Okay, so first video for Tenzig is showing the USB creation process. Um, so this is taking a USB and loading the um, Tenzig repurpose software onto it. So it, as you can see, it's relatively simple. You just insert your USB card and a uh, USB stick, should I say, and you just run the tool and point it at the latest image. Just takes a few seconds and the image is ready to go. In terms of the videos, we're not going to show the all the videos in their entirety. We'll post links to the full videos in the YouTube description below. This second video shows Tenzig after we've installed it onto the hard drive. Uh, and this is basically showing the aquarium demo. So as you can see, I'm going in and launching aquarium. And we're not changing any of the settings. This is just the default um, configuration of the aquarium app. As you can see, it's pretty smooth. And um, yeah, really good performance. This next video shows office.com um, that's been logged into through single sign-on through the Workspace One Intelligent Hub. And alongside that, we've got the NVIDIA New Dawn demo, as you can see, really clear, really smooth. Um, and it was equally as smooth when I ran it in full screen as well. Next up, We've got a uh, native YouTube performance. So this is just opening a browser, going to YouTube, picking a clip and playing it. Uh, again, performance is really good. Um, again, no, no optimization of Blast. This is just out of the box performance. Onto the management console. Tenzig offer two ways to access the management console. They've got a web interface and they've got a traditional sort of Windows client. Mm -hmm. um, the Windows client is really easy to set up. It's just a, it's just a Windows installer. Um, I actually installed this on a Windows 10 machine and it worked flawlessly straight away. Um, you can run a scan of a subnet. You can detect thin clients that it can see on that subnet. And then from there, you can see on the screen some of the options that you get in, a, in terms of like re-imaging it, configuring it, con remote controlling it, et cetera. All the features that I tested seem to work really well, including the remote shadowing, which you can see on the screen now. So just um, one thing, so I was gonna say, Dan, just one thing while we're looking at that, just to be clear, we haven't done a huge in-depth analysis and comparison of all the management tools, have we? It was more of a, let's just look at the basics. Can you do the things you need to do, like update configurations, remotely support, update software, particularly yeah. away from land, just the important things. But this is something we didn't do in previous years, so it was good to have a look at the different vendors to see what their offerings were like. Okay, thanks for that, Darren. One thing we should probably add is that you would have noticed there was no audio with some of those video playbacks. That's intentional because obviously we're talking over it. It, it would have just been the noise from a video and us talking, so we decided to leave those bits out. In terms of Google, um, they're quite unique in what they do in this space because of the nature of the operating system. So, um, you know, this is this is a Chrome-based operating system. We've looked at this over the past four years. On the results page, you can see that the results aren't there for 2018. Um, we decided to, to remove them just because information from four years ago isn't that relevant to where we are. So we just decided to keep the last few in. Um, in the previous years, this was actually Neverware. So this was uh, an acquisition that Google made of a company called Neverware. Uh, they had a product called Cloud Ready, which is now Google Flex, essentially. Um, in terms of the products and the feel of the products, still very similar. Um, some things have changed, though, similar to Tenzig in terms of boot time. 
uh, or, or conversion time, should I say. Boot time still very similar. And over, obviously the version of Chrome being used has been updated. In terms of protocol, because we're using the Horizon Chrome client, that only supports Blast. And in terms of power consumption, that's very similar to as it was a few years ago. Um, to be fair, though, that was a, a pretty low um, consumption or, or wattage usage compared to some of the other vendors that maybe had a bit of room, room for improvement. Um, in terms of management, Google products are really managed using the Google Admin console, often sort of referred to as uh, you know, the Workspace console now. And um, as a point of note, that can be integrated with Workspace ONE UEM, so we can unify the management and do it from that one place. If we go on now to look at some of the videos, um, first up, let's start the video, is the creation of the um, uh, Chromebooks itself or, or the you know, conversion stick. So we use the Chromebook recovery tool. So this is just an extension to a Chrome browser. Once you have that enabled, you can attach a key and you go through that recovery tool. So really, rather than picking out a particular vendor of Chromebook, you're saying you have uh, the OS Flex and you've got a USB attached and then it will create that, that bootable USB. So as Darren mentioned, we will create links and share all the videos, but um, you know, if we did them in an entirety, this would be like some three or four hour video, which I don't think anyone wants to watch. So as you can see, that's creating. So next up, we will have a look at what it looks like when it boots or, or images the, the actual device itself. Okay, so there you can see I have options, again, similar to Tenzig, I can convert, the laptop and actually install Chrome OS on the hard drive, or I can just boot from the USB. Every time we did our tests, so that all the tests are fair, we always try to convert the machine. If we don't, we'll, we'll call that out. But we convert the machine so it boots from the hard drive. Therefore, power consumption and performance tests and all the things we do are, are a lot fairer. Okay. Again, as we said, I will skip. But once that process is complete, the machine will reboot and I'll then be able to log in. Once um, logged in, I had access to the Horizon client. So I authenticated to the same farm that we've been using and then was able to launch one of the desktops. Okay, in this case, I'm connecting to one of the higher end, uh, you know, higher performance desktops. That's uh, got a, a vGPU in it. And so we're not just sitting here looking at um, sort of log on screens and things. I think the performance that I witnessed with this was very similar to that of Tenzig. So again, good performance, um, kind of as I would expect it. And it was you know, good to see those sort of higher end use cases. In terms of the management console, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, the, the Google Admin console is, is the console of choice. Um, from here, um, I can do some of the sort of typical things you'd expect. So cosmetics like changing wallpapers um, because of the relationship with obviously Google and, and the Chrome browser, I can manage the browser and block URLs. So I can you know, have like an approved and a denied list of, of what people can access. Um, so some sort of like web filtering essentially. In general, um, it, it, you know, it's a pretty rich tool and I can do most things that I want. Um, Personally, sometimes I, I I didn't find it that user friendly, just sort of the navigation. But it, but it's it's very flat, if that makes sense. So as as you can see, it's like a lot of long lists of profiles. Having those broken down and maybe in a bit more of a category would be a bit more useful. But um, it, it it did eventually make it quite easy. And also, the search function you have there is very powerful, so that I could just search for a particular feature. So that was one feature that I do think comes in handy because of the way that the content is displayed. So there you can see, I just remotely changed the wallpaper. But in general, um, you know, decent results from Google as I'd expect. So in terms of next, we are back over to Darren to look at iGel. Thanks, Matt. Yep, so we tested iGel for the last three years. As you can see, the requirement for CPU has gone up now that they no longer support x86. It's uh, the requ basic requirement now is x64. It still needs two gig of RAM and two gig of storage though, so that hasn't changed. 
imaging time was remarkably improved from the last release. So we're down to one minute, 45 seconds. And the boot time was under a minute as well. That was 50 seconds. So imaging and booting really fast, really slick, no issues at all. Browser versions, we've got uh, an up-to-date version of Chrome and an up-to-date version of Firefox. I have to say all the versions of all the software on the IGL device were all pretty up-to-date. That included the Ryzen client as well, which was running 2203, which at the time of testing was the most recent. IGL supports RDP, PCRIP, and Blast. The power consumption was really low, actually, um, down as low as eight watts when it was idle. It actually went even lower than that. I saw it at six, but I'd say on average it was hovering around eight. Power consumption when using Workspace One and Horizon went up to about 18 um, on average, I would say. Uh, the management tool for iGel is the Universal Management Suite, or they refer to it as UMS. So first off, we're going to take a look at the iGel um, imaging process. As you can see, it's all wizard driven. It's all relatively straightforward. And, you know, you, you can quite easily do it in under a couple of minutes. OK, so here's first boot up now that the um, iGel device has been imaged. As you can see, it launches the first time uh, configuration wizard, which allows you to do things like set the language, set the keyboard layout, time zone, connect to wireless, all those sorts of things you would expect from a newly installed operating system. Um, as soon as those are configured, you can start using the um, actual endpoint. Obviously, you can configure configuration of the applications locally, but a, a better and more likely scenario would be that you would use the management console to configure them and push them down to multiple devices at once. So would I be right in saying, Darren, that most use cases, users probably wouldn't see this because you just do it all centrally for the management console. So you probably wouldn't see this side of it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So this is the iGel um, device actually connecting to Aquaria. As you can see, performance is really slick. No issues whatsoever, no sort of pausing or stuttering. It seems pretty smooth. Uh, again, no blast configuration, just out of the box settings. But yeah, really nice. On to the management console. The UMS has got all the regular features you would expect, you know, in terms of imaging and configuration. It's actually got a lot of features in it. You can remotely image, you can remotely shadow, you can remotely configure, you can copy config from one place to another. You can do a whole range of different tasks as you can see on the screen. Okay, so um, I got the opportunity to test Strata Desk. Um, and as you can see, you know, um, um, Matt and Darren had tested um, in April, 2020 and in April, 21. So. I tested it obviously um, um, this August. So, in terms of the hardware requirements, it was it was the same. Um, and I think, in fairness, you know they're they're pretty low requirements, so that was that was good. The firmware version was um, three point four, and imaging time um, was really to me it seemed to be very very fast. So it had gone from you know three minutes twenty nine seconds in in April twenty twenty to uh, one minute twenty seconds. So really really fast. And what it would do, it, it basically um, ran the uh, image and then it just rebooted. And then the reboot was also extremely fast. It was literally 20 seconds. And I think it's, I think basically it was probably one of the fastest um, to actually boot. In terms of the browser support then, it was all, you know, pretty recent. So Mozilla Firefox 91.9 and, and Chromium as well, 98. The Horizon client version was 8.6, so extremely recent and then protocol supported was blast and pc over ip it also seemed to be you know i guess based on you know what what matt and darren were saying and um, the idle consumption seemed to be a little bit lower 
um, than what it was in April 2020. Um, and you know uh, that was that was an average really. I I saw it kind of dip down maybe sometimes to eight nine watts as well, but that was the average. Then when I was running Workspace One and Horizon, it was uh, it was around twenty watts. And then finally the management tool. Um, it's a nice management tool. It's called No Touch Center. So um, we we uh, went through a recording of that as well, which I'll talk through now. I should probably just add to explain. To, to the, those watching why some of the fields have got not applicable. So in 2021, um, we had some challenges with hardware. So some of the testing was done with virtual machines. So we felt recording power consumption and imaging time wasn't a fair comparison to, to previous years. So we just put not applicable for those particular tests. So this particular video is a very quick video, just going through the actual preparation of the USB. So formatting the USB and getting the installer um, um, onto the device ready to, to plug into our thin client. So pretty quick, not a, not a lot to see here. It basically just has its own inbuilt UNE booting um, tool, as you can see. And that basically does all the formatting as you'd expect and just detects the, the USB and and gets everything, gets the installer in place and up and running. So we can go on to the next one, Matt. So what you'll see is within here, this is basically the boot of Stratodesk. Um, so once Stratodesk boots, um, it's a little bit similar to maybe some of the other vendors where it will talk through some, some quick questions. But then basically what we can do is we can manage it directly um, from within the, uh, you know, ma manage it locally, I guess, if you like. But more commonly than not, what's going to happen is it's going to connect to the management console, which is called Stratodesk No Touch. Um, what I'm doing in this video is because I'm duplicating the display, I'm actually just um, I'm fixing it to a single monitor, and I'm also just joining it to the, the Wi-Fi network before I um, before I, I manage the um, I manage it centrally. So once it's up, once it's up and running, then um, I, I personally found it, you know, a very nice experience. Um, I also pushed down from the management console. Um, well, it, uh, yeah, I was able to push down the actual um, the, um, the the test drive server, and I was able to push down that config directly from the management server to the to the client. Once I launched it, what I'm going into here is I launched the uh, Nvidia Grid um, vGPU desktop similar to what we've tested on the other thin clients and in here then i was able to launch aquarium this is obviously default and um, running running the blast protocol as as we did with the other um with the other tests but the experience was was really really good i thought it was um it worked very well and um, once i ran and you'll see it in a moment once it pops up once we ran the aquarium you'll see that the performance is is really good so once I was able to launch the um, the vGPU desktop um, within Test Drive, what I'm doing here is I'm just launching Aquarium, and once Aquarium, you'll see that the once it's launched, you'll see that the you know the um, experience is really good. It seems to me to be you know very very smooth, very slick in how it was being delivered, and particularly with the actual latency that I was experiencing. So this is this is based this desktop is based in the US. So we can go to the next one. So this is just to take you through. This is looking at the actual Stratodesk um, No Touch um, uh, management, and you know it, it had all the usual features that you'd expect. So I could add in a single machine. I could also do you know a subnet range and search those machines. Personally, I found it quite um, intuitive um, in, in in terms of how to navigate the actual GUI, um, and it was also quite easy for me to add. I found it quite easy to add applications and to administer the environment. Um, and to do all the usual typical kind of actions that you'd expect, such as updating the firmware, um, updating applications, updating settings, wallpapers, um, and so on and so forth. And so forth. So, yeah, for uh, quite quite a nice experience. I found it personally found it quite kind of enterprise felt quite enterprise to me. So I I was then testing a uh, Unicon software. Um, so with Unicon software, um, I was testing um, um, the Elux. Um, thin client software, and then we were also testing the actual Scout management server, which I'll which I'll talk about now. 
So um, in terms of the hardware requirements, it was the same, um, um, same type of requirements. Obviously, the firmware version had come up, so we were testing against 6.2.104 now. Imaging time was a little bit less than, than what it was in April 2020. However, for me, the boot time did seem to be quite a significant bit longer for some reason. Um, I'm, not, I'm not too sure that why that was. You know, the device was fully imaged, but it just seemed to take that bit longer to boot. Um, you know, and, you know, once it booted, absolutely fine, but it did stand out to me that it, it just did take that little bit longer. Um, in terms of the browser versions, so there was basically built-in browser, then there was Mozilla, Mozilla Firefox, um, and also Chromium. In terms of the client version that we were testing against um, at the time of recording, it was 8.5.0, and then protocol supported Blast, PC over IP, um, and, and RDP. Power consumption then did seem to be a little bit lower so i, I kind of kept a good eye on this based on um you know what it was in april 2020 but definitely the average was around um 10 watts but then the power consumption when we were running workspace one horizon was pretty much the same around 19 watts and then finally we tested the management tool um and and all that it was um scout enterprise was was what we what i um what i used here So this is just um, going through creating the um, creating the USB key uh, to boot. In here, there's a handy little utility called StickWiz, um, and basically similar to all the rest of the um, the products. Basically, we just pick up the USB and it handled everything, formatted it, you know, um, did checksums and so on and so forth, and then it just wrote the actual installer to the USB, ready to actually boot um, onto the device. So pretty straightforward. So this is a slightly different uh, way of recording the actual um, what what happened, and the reason for this was just it was really it was based on my own video capturing tool. I kind of had to just record it via this angle as opposed to using it on a second screen. But it was just really I, I really wanted to still be able to show um, what the actual what the actual view was like um, when the, when the device was being booted um, off USB and then obviously being installed to the to the hard drive. Now, the one thing I did have is I did have a problem um, with with Elux and this, you know, this, I guess, was probably just needed some maybe a little bit more tweaking from my own perspective, because I did use, as we said, I used the default settings for Horizon um, that that had been shipped with Elux. But I did have a problem where launching some particular um, desktops in test drive, it would it would basically just um, I just got a uh, connection to the remote, remote computer ended, and um, so I wasn't able to fully test the vGPU capabilities. And um, in this particular video, what I am doing though is I am launching um, uh, Windows 10 desktop, and I wanted to just show what it's like with Blast, and um, so I was able to connect to that one. But again. I'm not going to say that was a problem with with Elux um, itself. It could have been just a slight tweak that I needed to do on my end, but I did get to test it um, um, somewhat, um, and I was able to connect to 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 um, certain desktops. Then we have um, this is the actual um, Elux um, Scout Enterprise. So Scout Enterprise then um, it's quite a quite a simplistic. A management console where you know you just can really list your applications and you can update them and you can specify what applications you want to include. Obviously, the out-of-the-box browsers, Firefox built in and Chromium were there. Um, as as where um, um VM VMware Horizon, and you could specify you know the URL and username passwords and and specific settings and so on around that. In terms of the actual management of device, again, as I said, very, very simplistic, but at the end of the day, you know, everything, everything worked and it worked perfectly. So um, um, from a management perspective, so within here, all the usual expectations were there, such as being able to, you know, do firmware, firmware updates, reboots, um, subnet detection, wallpapers, all that kind of capability was in here. So um, much the same as, as the other vendors. Thanks for that, JD. So I'm just going to talk about uh, ZTIM, which, as mentioned, was um, you know new to this year. So when we look at the results, 
we haven't got anything in terms of a, of a comparison because this is a, a new one to us. Um, as we mentioned, we sort of did all our testing in August 2020. So the firmware we used, uh, I think Darren touched on it. There, there could be a newer version at the time of seeing this, but it's what we did at the time. In terms of the hardware requirements, you know, again, very similar to some of those other vendors. Um, there seems to be a, a similar pattern to, the, to those vendors that are using maybe Linux as their base OS. So, you know, 64 bit, two gig of RAM. In terms of imaging time, three and a half minutes. As I say, no real comparison to any previous year. But for me, that's a pretty average time. And also that boots on of 20 seconds. I think that's pretty quick. For most Linux disties, we kind of tended to see times around that. In terms of browser versions, quite a nice feature here. There was not only sort of uh, Firefox and Chrome like some of the others, but also Edge as well. So there was there was there were choices here, and um, Zetim have, have have chosen to to support Edge for Linux as well. In terms of Horizon client twenty one eleven, um, what I just did note is that in some of the the other um, results we do mention the sort of previous numbering format like eight point five or eight point four. So I will bring up a list to show what they actually relate to. But 2111 was the Horizon client that was used. In terms of power consumption, again, similar to some of the other vendors that we saw, when it's idling, just over 11 watts. And when we're actually uh, using Horizon and Workspace ONE, around 20 watts. In terms of the management tool, the tool that uh, we, you know, is used to support is ZConf. So first off, let's have a look at the creation tool. So this is the tool um, that essentially we can use to, to, to build the USB key to then do that conversion. Similar to some of the other vendors, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a handy tool, Windows based tool that we can then use to actually just, um, you know, pull that image across and then uh, inject that onto the USB. Once that's created, essentially I can boot the laptop from that. So as you can see, it mentions Chrome there because that's the, the, the previous uh, operating system that was on there. So when I boot, it's going to boot Z Transformer and essentially re-image that hard drive with uh, the, you know, the specific ZTIM image. Yeah, as I mentioned, we will post all the links to these, but um, yeah, rest assured, you know, similar process to some of the other conversion. So once the device um, it has been actually sort of, you know, imaged and created, we get, as you can see, a, a relatively sort of modern looking desktop, um, not too dissimilar to some of the others, but you can see there those three browsers I mentioned. What you're seeing on the screen is me creating that horizon connection. So what I will do is just skip forward um, a little bit just to kind of show you what performance is like. So here, much the same, we've launched that uh, uh, NVIDIA video to see what that's like. Um, it, it, it felt a little bit jerky, but without um, really diving into it, I, I think sometimes it's conditions. Um, sometimes it's obviously just kind of, um, you know, where, where I was and what latency I was getting at the time. Um, also, it's, it's also worth mentioning, sometimes these videos look a lot better to us when we're recording it than they do when you're watching it back because we're recording it all through Zoom. So. Um, you know, rest assured, I, I was happy with the performance I was getting and the general experience that I got uh, using the Zetim device. In terms of the management software, um, some great functionality in there. I think it's pretty intuitive, to be honest. I, I reached out to this, the um, Zetim team a, a couple of times to, to help me. But um, yeah, I found it pretty intuitive. I was able to do a, a broadcast across the network and find the machine. and then. Um, I think there are things you can do with DHCP tags so that devices kind of report in automatically. So a broadcast isn't always necessarily needed, but for the purposes of what I was doing here, I did that. I then sort of made some configuration changes. I shadowed the device. Um, as I say, there are some zero touch deployment options like auto config. I think it also supports REST APIs. So there is some um, sort of custom sort of management integration you can do as well. Um, as you can see, it's, it's pretty intuitive, as I mentioned, very GUI driven. Um, you, you know, you have the VMware tab and security tab, display tab. I think it's you know pretty obvious where you need to make changes and configure things. So as a whole, I think the experience was pretty good using um, Zconf. 
So just before we go to the, to the final slide, I've just dropped across to Wikipedia. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we sort of mix the horizon client numbering there. So I just want to be clear. So where, for example, maybe we referenced we were using 2111, that referred to the 2111 client, which was released in November 2021. And in other versions, if it was mentioned, it would say 8.5, that would be, let's say if we go to 8.5, would be April 2022. So if you then go back to the client, the corresponding client would be that one there, the 2203. So again, apologies for kind of the mixed um, numbering there, but with every release of Horizon, essentially there's a release of the client and the, and the two match up. Where we drop all the links to all the videos in their entirety, we'll also include a link through to this Wikipedia page, just so um, you've got this as reference. So really from um, all of us here, I mean, you know, the, the main purpose, uh, you know, of everything we've done here is wasn't really to produce a, a result where we said, oh, we think the best conversion tool is this. It was really just to show you and share with you the options that are out there share our experiences and, and, and share some of the things that we saw and some of the things that we looked at. As a whole, I, you know, over the last four years, not just this time, I've enjoyed the, the testing we've done. I don't think there's been a device that I've looked at that um, has been particularly weak. I think they're all relatively strong in their own way. Um, when you're looking at Linux-based solutions, often they're similar because fundamentally they're all on Linux. They all have the same, um, capabilities of, of like the horizon client then equally could have some limitations because of it being linux um obviously the google one here is slightly different to the rest because it's built on a chrome operating system um and with that again brings some of its own you know, potential limitations and challenges you know if, if you look at chrome devices in general you, you know you can install android applications on those devices with google flex you can't you kind of um, restricted to purely to, to Chrome applications, which is why we use the Horizon Chrome client. Um, but that aside, again, thank you for watching and thank you for your time. And I'll, I'll pass over to Darren and JD to express their thanks. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And thanks everyone for watching. Hope you found the session useful. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, thanks to, uh, to Matt and Darren for inviting me into this project. Really enjoyed it. And I hope everyone that's watching it gets benefit from it.